Hi, I'm Pranamia and you're watching Pages of the Globe. So if you're new to my channel, hi, I'm Pranamia and I read short stories and poems and I give you a very good deep analysis about them and then I tell you a little bit about the author and the historical context. And if you want more information, go, go ahead and check out the pin video um, on my page. But without further ado, let's get on with the intro. So the story that I'm going to be reading today is All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. Now this is a very famous short story and it is like very much known by a lot of people. If you were in school at some point, you probably have read this, especially in America. Um, but it is one of Ray Bradbury's most famous novels. And it has a lot to do about just human systems and how they work and whether they are actually good or not. I will say this story is mainly very famous in my opinion because it invokes very strong like emotions. It invokes a lot of strong emotions, specifically anger. Um, however, it does, you know, center around a group of little nine-year-olds, so like third or fourth graders around that kind of time period, that um, age period frame but they are all actually living on venus which is so cool and they have a civilization in venus and it's actually a very like stable civilization it's just about how you know they live in venus and fun fact about venus it actually only rains for two hours every or the sun comes out for two hours every seven years otherwise it is literally raining non-stop so the story is basically about how all of summer in a day happens because you only get two hours in one day. So that's two hours, one day, and that is every seven years. So it's a lot. Um, without further ado, let's get on with the video. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment down below which short story or poem you would like me to read next. All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. Ready? Now? Soon. Do the scientists really know? Will it happen today, will it? Look, look, see for yourself. The children press to each other like so many roses, so many weeds intermixed, peering out for a look at the hidden sun. It rained. It had been raining for seven years, thousands upon thousands of days compounded and filled from one end to the other with rain, with the drum and gush of water, with the sweet crystal fall of showers and the concussion of storms, so heavy, they were tidal waves come over the islands. A thousand forests had been crushed under the rain and grown up a thousand times to be crushed again. This was the way life was forever on the planet Venus. And this was a schoolroom of the children of the rocket men and women who had come to a reigning world to set up civilization and live out their lives. It's stopping, it's stopping, yes, yes. Margo stood apart from them, from these children who could never remember a time when there wasn't rain and rain and rain. They were all nine years old, and if there had been a day seven years ago when the sun came out for an hour and showed its face to the sunned world, they could not recall. Sometimes at night she heard them stir in remembrance, and she knew they were dreaming and remembering a gold or a yellow crayon or a coin large enough to buy the world with. She knew they thought that they remembered a warmness, like a blushing in the face, in the body, in the arms and legs and trembling hands. But then they always awoke to the tatting drum, the endless shaking down of clear bead necklaces upon the roof, the walk, the gardens, the forests, and their dreams gone. All day yesterday, they had read in class about the sun, about how like a lemon it was and how hot. They had written small stories or essays or poems about it. I think the sun is a flower that blooms for just one hour. That was Margot's poem, read in a quiet voice in a still classroom while the rain was falling outside. Aw, you didn't write that, protested one of the boys. I did, said Margot. I did. William, said the teacher. But that was yesterday. Now the rain was slackening and the children were crushed in the great thick windows. Where's the teacher? She'll be back. She'd better hurry. We'll miss it. They turned on themselves like feverish wheel, all tumbling spokes. Margot stood alone. She was a very frail girl who looked as though 
She'd been lost in the rain for years, and the rain had washed out the blue from her eyes and the red from her mouth and the yellow from her hair. She was an old photograph, dusted from an album, whined away, and if she spoke at all, her voice would be a ghost. Now she stood separate, staring at the rain in the loud, wet world beyond a huge glass. "'What are you looking at?' said William. Margot said nothing. "'Speak when you're spoken to.' He gave her a shove, but she did not move. Rather, she let herself be moved, only by him and nothing else. They edged away from her. They would not look at her. She felt them go away, and this was because she would play no games with them in the echoing tunnels of the underground city. If they tagged her and ran, she stood blinking after them and did not follow. When the class sang songs about happiness and life and games, her lips barely moved. Only when they sang about the sun and the summer did her lips move as she watched the drenched windows. And then, of course, the biggest crime of all was that she had came here only five years ago from Earth, and she remembered the sun and the way the sun was and the sky was when she was four in Ohio. And they, they had been on Venus all their lives, and they had been only two years old when last the sun came out and had long since forgotten the color and the heat of it and the way it really was. But Margot remembered. It's like a penny, she said once, eyes closed. No, it's not, the children cried. It's like a fire, she said, in the stove. You're lying, you don't remember, cried the children. But she remembered and stood quietly apart from all of them and watched the patterning windows. And once, a month ago, she had refused to shower in the school shower rooms, had clutched her head to her ears and over her head, screaming the water must touch her head. So after that, dimly, dimly she sensed it. She was different, and they knew her difference and kept away. There was talk that her father and mother were taking her back to Earth next year. It seemed vital to her that they do so, though it would mean the loss of thousands of dollars to her family. And so the children hated her for all these reasons of big and little consequence. They hated her pale snow face, her waiting silence, her thinness, her possible future. Get away, the boy gave her another shove. What are you waiting for? And then, for the first time, she turned and looked at him. And what she was waiting for was in her eyes. Well, don't wait around here, cried the boy savagely. You won't see nothing. Her lips moved. Nothing, he cried. It was all a joke, wasn't it? He turned to the other children. Nothing's happening today, is it? They all blinked at him, and then understanding, laughed and shook their heads. Nothing, nothing. Oh, but, Margo whispered, her eyes helpless. But this is the day the scientists predict, they say. They know the sun. All a joke, said the boy, and seized her roughly. Hey, everybody, let's put her in the closet before the teacher comes. No, said Margot, falling back. They surged about her, caught her up, and bore her, protesting, and then pleading, and then crying, back into a tunnel, a room, a closet, where they slammed and locked the door. They stood looking at the door and saw it tremble from her beating and throwing herself against it. They heard her muffled cries, and then smiling, they turned and went out and back down the tunnel, just as the teacher arrived. Ready, children? She glanced at her watch. Yes, said everyone. Are we all here? Yes. The rain slackened, still more. They crowded to the huge door. The rain stopped. It was as if in the midst of a film concerning an avalanche, a tornado, a hurricane, a volcanic eruption... Something first had gone wrong with the sound apparatus, thus muffling and finally cutting off all noise, all the blasts and repercussions and thunders, and then, second, ripped the film from the projector and inserted in its place a peaceful tropical slide, which did not move or tremor. The world ground to a standstill. The silence was so immense and unbelievable that you felt your ears had been stuffed or you had lost your hearing altogether. The children put their hands to their ears. They stood apart. The door slid back, and the smell of the silent, waiting world came into them. The sun came out. It was the color of flaming bronze, and it was very large. And the sky around it was a blazing blue tile color. And the jungle burned with sunlight as the children, released from their spell, rushed out yelling into the springtime. Now don't go too far, called the teacher after them. You've only two hours, you know. You wouldn't want to get caught out. But they were running and turning their faces up to the sky and feeling the sun on their cheeks like a warm iron. They were taking off their jackets and letting the sun burn their arms.
Oh, it's much better than the sun lamps, isn't it? Much, much better. They stopped running and stood in the great jungle that covered Venus, that grew and never stopped growing, tumultuously, even as you watched it. It was a nest of octopi, clustered up great arms of flesh-like weave, wavering, flowering this brief spring. It was the color of rubber and ash, this jungle, from the many years without sun. It was the color of stones and white cheeses and ink, and it was the color of the moon. The children lay out laughing on the jungle mattress and heard it sigh and squeak under them, resilient and alive. They ran among the trees, they slipped and fell, they pushed each other, they played hide-and-seek and tag, but most of all, they squinted at the sun until the tears ran down their faces. They put their hands up to that yellowness and that amazing blueness, and they breathed of the fresh, fresh air and listened and listened to the silence, which suspended them in a blessed sea of no sound and no motion. They looked at everything and savored everything. Then, wildly, like animals, escaped from their caves. They ran and ran in shouting circles. They ran for an hour, did not stop running. And then, in the midst of their running, one of the girls wailed. Everyone stopped. The girl, standing in the open, held out her hand. Oh, look, look, she said, trembling. They came slowly to her open palm. In the center of it, cupped and huge, was a single raindrop. She began to cry, looking at it. They glanced quietly at the sky. Oh, oh. A few cold drops fell on their nose and their cheeks and their mouths. The sun faded behind a stir of mist. A wind blew cool around them. They turned and started to walk back towards the underground house, their hands at their sides, their smiles vanishing away. A boom of thunder startled them like leaves before a new hurricane. They tumbled upon each other and ran. Lightning struck ten miles away, five miles away, a mile, a half mile. The sky darkened into a midnight in a flash. They stood in the doorway of the underground for a moment until it was raining hard. Then they closed the door and heard the gigantic sound of the rain falling in tons and avalanches everywhere and forever. Will it be seven more years? Yes. Then one of them gave a little cry. Margo! What? She's still in the closet where we locked her. Margo. They stood as if someone had driven them, like so many stakes, into the floor. They looked at each other and they looked away. They glanced out at the world that was raining now and raining and raining steadily. They could not meet each other's glances. Their faces were solemn and pale. They looked at their hands and feet, their faces down. Margo. One of the girls said, well, no one moved. Go on, whispered the girl. They walked slowly down the hall in the sound of the cold rain. They turned through the doorway to the room in the sound of the th storm and thunder, lightning on their faces, blue and terrible. They walked over to the closest door, slowly, and stood by it. Behind the closet door was only silence. They unlocked the door even more slowly and let Margot out. The End all right, so that was All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury. Now, this is a short story that invokes a lot of emotion into people because it makes them so angry, so frustrated, especially at the way that Margot is treated and the fact that she is obviously very depressed and not happy because she can't ever see the sun. And the two hours that she actually does get, the chance that she finally gets to actually see the sun in five years, She's denied that chance by a bunch of bratty kids. So it's kind of obvious that this story is incredibly famous and kind of invokes a lot of strong emotions. But what are the main ideas? What do we see in the story that makes so much sense? Well, first of all, one of the biggest main ideas is the fact that humans need more than just sustenance and protection to thrive. Margot's experience on Venus vividly illustrates the idea that humans need more than mere sustenance to thrive. Presumably, Margot has enough to eat and drink. She lives underground where she's protected from the violent rains and storms of Venus. But her physical appearance suggests that she's actually very miserable and slowly deteriorating in Venus. Despite having enough food and water, she looks washed out and frail as flour deprived of its vital nutrients. 
It's very obvious that she needs something more than just food, water, and shelter in order to live. Which then begs the question of survival versus thriving. Yes, you can survive with food, water, shelter, but can you thrive with it? Obviously, in Margot's case, not. And it's also not just the lack of sunlight that's causing her to deteriorate. After all, the colony does use sun lamps. Rather, for Margot, the problem is to uh, being able to, un to not see or experience the sun itself. The sun represents life and hope and the promise of a better tomorrow. Without this, Margot cannot actually survive. Margot is not the only child who needs the sun and the hope and promise it represents. When the rest of the class go outside to be in the sunshine, they don't just lie in the sun and soak up its nutrients. They actually stare into it until their eyes water and they run around shouting almost uncontrollably. This shows that the sun provides something just as important as warmth and nutrients, if not more. It provides joy, which is something that humans cannot live without. Another very important main idea here is that human systems, even impressive ones, are often inhumane. Bradbury's dystopian tale presents a civilization that accomplishes incredible things, yet ultimately fails its people. In the world of all summer and a day, humans have succeeded in traveling through space and setting up a fledgling civilization in an inhospitable planet. That's incredible. Some of the colonists have been on Venus for at least nine years and have actually been able to raise children there. So the colony has at a minimum managed to operate and function. They have established a school with at least one teacher, which indicates that the new inhabitants of Venus are not scratching out a life of bare survival. It's actually a very stable civilization. However, this impressiveness at a glance covers up a much darker truth. Many of the people are suffering. Margot and William are the most obvious examples of this, but the ways in which all children react to playing in the sunshine suggests that the suffering is widespread and lurking beneath the surface of their collective success. The children do not experience their time in the sun as a mere novelty. Rather, it is deeply meaningful for them. The fact that this experience will only happen once every seven years is plenty evidence that, impressive as the civilization is, it still failed its citizens. On a smaller scale, the bullying of the children in which the children engage is another example of the inhumanity inherent in a social system. Bradbury expresses the idea that human systems can be inhumane in many of his works. In fact, Bradbury himself was a self-educated and he spent his time reading and writing in the library rather than attending college and was very critical of the education system, considering it creativity, creatively stifling. In this story, school can allow children to learn and grow, but it is also structured in a way that allows for bullying and intimidation. In the story, Margot's differences and creativity are punished by her peers, demonstrating the ways in which human systems often foster cruelty. Now, I could go on and on about um, this story, but instead I'm actually going to go ahead and connect it to a very famous book and movie called Into the Wild. Not to be confused with The Call of the Wild, which I was I was very confused because I read both and I was like, why do I feel like there's two completely different stories here? And then I was like, oh, wait, it's because they are two completely different stories. So Into the Wild is a it's actually a book um, and the book was written by John Crocker and the movie was actually it was very famous, I think, and it was actually released in like 2007 but it was huge and the plot of it is basically it's about this guy who he's actually he's a very smart man he just graduated from emory university that's literally like the biggest thing i remember is because i was watching it and i was like oh my god this guy literally graduated from emory and at the time like i was looking at colleges and i was like yeah emory is like huge um so obviously he's a very smart guy but he's kind of disenchanted with modern society after discovering that he and his sister were born out of wedlock. Now, at one point, he decides to basically destroy everything about himself, and then he donates all his money to Oxfam. So he destroys Kenneth Carr's identification. And he sets out on a cross-country drive in his car to experience life in the wilderness. He doesn't tell anyone what he's doing or where he's going, which causes his family to become very anxious. Now, he goes through so many, like, just 
I don't want to say strained, but just a lot of hardships as he lives in the wild. And he's just not doing so well right now, honestly. We actually see the fact that he has, he lives, at one point he's living in an abandoned city bus that he calls the magic bus. And he does seem to be like content with isolation and the beauty of nature and the thrill of living off the land. And he hunts his own food with a gun and he reads books and keeps a journal as he prepares for his new life in the wild. Now, four months later, life has just become even more hard and he makes several, several poor decisions. Trying to live off the land, he hunts down this like moose with his rifle, but he can't preserve the meat and it spoils within days. As his supplies dwindle, he realizes that nature can be very harsh. He concludes that true happiness can only be found when shared with others, and he seeks to return from the wild to his friends and family. However, he finds that the stream he crossed during the winter has become wide and deep, and he is unable to cross. In a desperate act, he gathers and eats roots and plants. He confuses similar plants and eats a poisonous one, slowly dying. And... He continues to document his process of self-realization and imagines what it might have been like if he had managed to return to his family. He writes a farewell note and then crawls into his sleeping bag to die. I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing I remember from that story, there were two things. The fact that he was an Emory graduate and the second one was the fact that he is literally dying and he realizes that this happiness that he was trying to find in the wild, that he was so determined to find by himself in nature, he realized that he could only tr truly find it when it was shared with others. Now, I know the message is kind of different between both of these stories, but what I think is so interesting is the fact that in All Summer of the Day, we find that no matter how hard humans try to, you know, survive and thrive by themselves in this sort of new land, they simply cannot. They need things like joy and the same thing happens in here with McCandles who is um the main character of the story if you didn't know his name is Chris McCandles and Chris in this in um into the wild he also finds here that even though he tried so hard to survive in the wilderness and find joy in nature by itself he realized he had to share it with someone I think that is such an important message, both of them being the fact that you need, in, in order to serve, like genuinely thrive, you need joy. And in order to have joy, you need to be able to share it with others. Now that is it from me today. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment down below which short story or poem you would like me to read next.